Thanks, everybody, for coming. You don't need to clap for me. I'm not the real speaker. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming, though. I'm really excited to, to have these speakers here today. I'm really grateful for their presence. Uh, I'm also really grateful for Pete and the Harvard Law Forum for doing so much work to, to sponsor and put on this, uh, this event. I'm also grateful for uh, the Reparatory Justice Initiative uh, and the Harvard Law School ACLU, both of which have co-sponsored uh, this event. So thank you to those of you involved in those organizations. Um, just to give a brief introduction to Fania and Peter, Fania is a leading restorative justice practitioner um, in the United States and goes throughout the, the world. <laughs> um, she founded Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. Um, before that, she was a longtime uh, racial justice and social justice activist. Um, she helped lead the campaign to free her sister, Angela Davis, from prison in the early 1970s. Um, and uh, she's very committed to the cause of uh, remaking society and creating new visions of justice. Um, Peter is uh, a longtime law professor, and he was president of New College of Law in California, uh, professor there for 30 years. Um, he's the author of a number of books, including this latest one, The Desire for Mutual Recognition. Um, this book just came out. We have five copies available for sale for 20 bucks. If you want one, uh, come speak to me outside. Um, he was a founding participant and leader in the critical legal studies movement uh, and continues to work with a, a group that both Fania and Peter are part of called PySLAP, the Project for Integrating Spirituality, Law, and Politics. Um, here's the website for that organization, spiritlawpolitics.org. And there's a conference on October, uh, which you're welcome to attend if you want. So check out that website. Um, I wanted to just bring up something that I read the other day, and it's something in uh, Martin Luther King's, one of Martin Luther King's speeches, where he said that when he and Ella Baker and other folks started the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they made it their mission to save the soul of America. Uh, and I think that's not just because uh, America has done a lot of evil, <laughs> and so its soul needs saving, but because they recognized that underlying racism and other forms of oppression and division are deep social, psychological, and spiritual harms uh, and fears. Um, and I think that's the amazing insight of both Fania and Peter, that they're wanting to address those deeper underlying, underlying spiritual and social traumas and fears that both motivate racists and uh, hurt and harm and, and stay with the people who are victims of racism. Um, so the question is, how can law do that? How can law address those underlying deep fears and pains? Um, is there a way that law can, instead of pulling pull people apart and dividing people, is there a way that law can support beloved community? Um, so that's what they're here for, and uh, I'm really grateful and excited to hear from them. Thank you. Fanya's going to come up and speak first, so let's give her a hand. Thank you so much, uh, Ross, and thank you, Peter, uh, the organizers of this event, um, and thank you all for uh, taking your lunch uh, to spend time with us uh, this afternoon. Um, I am doubly, I'm honored to be here. I'm doubly honored to be speaking uh, with uh, Peter Gable, my old friend um, and colleague. Um, I want to honor the ancestors of this land, the Wampanoag, and in honoring them, we acknowledge that this is an occupied land upon which we stand. Um, this is a post-genocidal land. And like the original harm of slavery, we have yet as a nation to tell the whole truth about this genocide, take responsibility for it, and make amends. We are a nation born in unspeakable terror and trauma, original wounds from which we have yet to heal as a nation and as institutions and as individuals. 
And because we have not healed, this original trauma perpetually reenacts itself in many different guises over and over and over again. Slavery and genocide are not dead. They have only evolved, as Brian Stevenson has said. I do wish to acknowledge the people of Cam Cambridge for declaring the second week of October Indigenous Peoples Day. And I also wish to acknowledge the work that you have been doing and are doing here at Harvard Law, uh, catalyzed by activist campaigns led by students of color, to tell the truth about Harvard's direct complicity in slavery and the slave trade. I want to recognize not only this truth-telling that's being done, but there are steps that are being made, first steps toward making amends, not just apologizing, not just telling the truth, but actually taking action uh, to make it right. And that's whether we're talking about the, the removal of the official shield because it contained the family crest of a slave owner and slave trader who financially supported Harvard in its early years, or renaming buildings to honor the slaves who served in them. And most recently, I believe in the fall, uh, unveiling a memorial uh, during the biennial celebration, honoring enslaved peoples whose labor made possible the founding of Harvard Law. Finally, I want to invoke the names of Derek Bell, of Charles Ogletree, of Lonnie Guineer, all Harvard Law professors and leading lights, especially in civil rights law, and mentors to me. I'm going to give you a brief kind of overview of restorative justice. First, how many of you have read a book on restorative justice? Okay, and how many of you done trainings in restorative justice? Okay, so for some of you, this very brief uh, overview will be a little repetitive, but please bear with me. Before I get to that, I'd like to share just a bit of my story. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama during the civil rights era because of pervasive terror, racial terror, we knew my native city as Birmingham. I actually lived in a neighborhood that was called Dynamite Hill because of the frequency of bombings by the Ku Klux Klan and white citizens councils and other terroristic uh, groups. Um, in their attempts to drive out black people who had moved into a previously all white neighborhood. We were lucky, our home was never bombed, but homes all around us were. And then on September 15th, 1963, I lost two childhood friends, close friends, in the Birmingham Sunday School bombing. Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson. This bombing especially, in, and all of the events that occurred during my formative years uh, crystallized within me a passion for justice, and I sort of was set on this path as a warrior for justice, a lifetime of activism. I also became a civil rights uh, trial attorney. But after almost three decades of angrily fighting injustice as a trial lawyer and activist, I became physically ill. I became physically ill from having to cultivate the hyper-rational, hyper-masculinist, hyper-aggressive qualities that I was forced to cultivate in order to be a successful trial lawyer and a successful activist. I kind of intuited at the time that in order to restore balance, I needed to invite more spiritual energies, more healing energies into my life. So I synchronistically discovered this PhD program that uh, allowed me to study in Africa with healers, apprentice with one healer in particular in South Africa. After completing the apprenticeship and returning home to the United States and receiving my PhD, I discovered restorative justice, a justice that heals harm instead of replicating it. And actually it was Peter Gable 
and the Project on Integrating Spirituality, Law, and Politics that made possible this discovery. Uh, Peter organized a conference, and I met a district attorney from Austin, Texas, um, who first taught me about restorative justice. The discovery of restorative justice was an epiphany for me. It allowed me to integrate the healer, the warrior, and the lawyer in me. It is a justice that repairs damaged relationships instead of shattering them further. As a trial lawyer, I can tell you so many stories of how even when we won civil rights cases and got handsome verdicts, um, the relationships between the employer and the employee, my client, were more damaged than ever at the end of that legal process. Restorative justice is a justice that creates social peace rather than deepening social conflict. A justice that sees crime as harm and justice as healing. Ever since that day when I learned about restorative justice, I have been writing, teaching, and speaking about restorative justice all over the world. I also co-founded and for 10 years directed the nationally acclaimed nonprofit Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. And that uh, acronym is RJOY, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. RJOY works with justice systems, schools, and communities throughout the nation. We provide consultation, training, and technical assistance to promote, to promote restorative policies and practices. RJOY's successes have been featured on PBS, NPR, and the New York Times, CBS, the Smithsonian Story Corps, and elsewhere. After launching pilot programs in Oakland schools that increased academic outcomes while decreasing racial disparities, expulsions, suspensions, and violence, the school district adopted restorative justice as official policy. And today it is in 40 schools in the Oakland Unified School District. Additionally, among other projects, we are engaging in a truth-telling, racial healing, and reparations initiative to transform historical violence against African Americans historical and contemporary violence. In an initiative, we're also involved in an initiative to create a restorative city in Oakland. And thirdly, we have recently begun to engage in consultation and facilitation of circles to transform sexual harm, particularly in the restaurant industry and in national and local organizations. So let's talk about, is my mic on? I just, I don't think it is, is it? All right. We can hear you, but I don't you can hear me? Sorry about that. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Okay. So a little about restorative justice fundamentals. Restorative justice first arose in Ontario, Canada in the early 70s and then in Indiana in the US out of the frustration of persons harmed, persons causing harm, communities and justice professionals within, with the dysfunction of our criminal justice system. You notice I didn't use the terms victims and offenders, persons harmed and persons causing harm. We do that intentionally. Um, restorative justice uh, doesn't see a bright line that divides persons who've been harmed with persons uh, who cause harm. Restorative justice does not reduce persons to the worst thing that happened to them or to the worst thing that they did. Uh, so we try to avoid using those sort of reified uh, terms. Inspired by indigenous values, restorative justice is a philosophy and a theory of justice that emphasizes bringing together everyone affected by wrongdoing to collaboratively address needs and obligations and to heal the harm to relationships as much as possible. It addresses needs, obligations, and it seeks to heal the harm to relationships as a result of crime or wrongdoing. And um, we use primarily three models. The first and most popular model is probably the peacemaking circle model. But victim-offender dialogue, and I have to use it in this context because that's the name of the model, unfortunately, um, is a second, uh, uh, a second model. Restorative community conferencing is a third. Restorative justice is applied in multiple contexts, including schools, families, workplaces, the justice system, and to transform large-scale social harm. 
Restorative justice is a profoundly relational practice. Restorative justice pioneer Howard Zair links it to the Judeo-Christian concept of shalom, emphasizing right relationships between individuals, between groups, between people and the earth, and between people and the divine. In African traditions, restorative justice is linked to Ubuntu. I am a human being through my relationships with other humans and with all the Earth's inhabitants. In Lakesh, the Mayan, I am the other you. Mitakio uh, Yasin, Lakota Sioux, we are all relatives. So this is the fundamental indigenous um, teaching uh, that is the, the foundation of restorative justice. Many people think of restorative justice as solely a conflict resolution method, akin to alternative dispute resolution, akin to arbitration. But restorative justice is far more than that. Uh, it's a way of life. It's a worldview based on indigenous worldviews. Our adversarial system is based upon a Roman notion of justice as just desserts. If I cause someone to suffer, then I must be caused to suffer. Because this creates an imbalance in the scales of justice, and that balance, imbalance cannot be uh, rebalanced until the same thing happens to me. If I inflict harm, that creates an imbalance in the scales of justice. The only way to rebalance and do justice is for me to be caused harm. In other words, we respond to the original harm with a second harm. Ours is a system that harm people who harm people to show that harming people is wrong. And what does that do? That just replicates harm until harm saturates our very existence. And we can see this harm that is all around us. It is not just the judicial system that is based on this sort of retributive uh, notion of causing harm to people who have caused harm. It is our entire culture. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, how history is causing, is calling us to uh, learn to become experts in healing. We are experts in harming now. We know how to harm really, really well. Uh, before I close, let me just go briefly through the data. <clears throat> Multiple international studies support restorative justice effectiveness <clears throat> in reducing reoffending and transforming people and relationships. Both harmed and responsible persons, according to the studies, are more satisfied receiving better outcomes and greater accountability. Persons harmed are, are less likely to fear the person who hurt them and less likely to fear the possibility of re-victimization than those going through the criminal justice system. A recent report on Oakland's restorative diversion program documents a nearly 50% reduction um, in recidivism. Uh, compared to young people who go through uh, the traditional uh, juvenile justice system. A study of Oakland's school-based RJ program shows a 50% reduction in out-of-school suspensions, a 128% increase in test scores, 60% increase in graduation rates, and 56% reduction in dropouts. Uh, so we're not only seeing racial disparities decrease and suspensions decrease, and when we decrease suspensions, by the way, we are interrupting the school-to-prison pipeline because when students are suspended even once, according to the study, a study by the UCLA Civil Rights Center, their chances of being incarcerated triple. So we're not only seeing reduction in racial disparities and in suspensions, but we're also seeing increased academic outcomes in restorative justice programs. I'm a witness. Students with failing grades and multiple incarcerations who were not expected to graduate, not only graduate but achieve 3.0 plus GPAs. Girls who were longtime enemies become friends after sitting in a peacemaking circle. 
Instead of fighting, students come into the restorative justice room and ask for a talking piece and a circle to talk through instead of fight through their differences. Youth and adults who walk into a circle feeling anger toward one another end up embracing. I don't know if any of you have seen some of the videos on the victim offender dialogues. Have you seen, has anyone seen Meeting with a Killer? Uh, that's a really interesting one if you're interested in knowing more about how restorative justice works and especially how this particular model works. In that video, a young man who had been convicted of killing a woman met with the family members of this woman. After a long preparation period, you don't bring people who have caused such grievous harm together with the persons who've been harmed uh, willy-nilly. You spend a lot of time preparing so that we can make sure that when the people come together, no reharming is done. But that video is a good example of how amazing healing, <coughs> seemingly miraculous healing, can occur through a well-facilitated restorative justice process. So in closing, restorative justice invites a paradigm shift in the way we think about and do justice. It challenges the fundamental assumptions in the dominant discourse about justice. I talked about our system being based on a Roman notion of just desserts, and our system being a system that harms people who harm people to show that harming people is wrong. So with all of the harm around us, whether it's harm to our bodies, to our family members, our loved ones, our communities, our earth, our waters, our air. All of us are good at causing harm. Restorative justice is asking us, and I believe history is asking us, to become good at healing. And I thank you for answering this call by being here today and learning more about restorative justice and about uh, spiritual, spirituality and law and politics. <laughs> thank you. Just go in the pocket. Uh, hi, greetings, so thank you for coming. Um, so I uh, uh, want to say a little bit about my own law school experience as a Harvard Law student in 1969. But let me start out by saying that Fania's description of the aspiration of restorative justice to heal relationships to create, a, to transform a situation in which people had previously been separated and enable them to come into connection with each other through a healing process, uh, gets to a, a sort of core dimension, in my view, of what, it, of what it means to be a social being, what it means to be a human being, who we all really are. And that is that we, we all fundamentally long for, have a desire for authentic mutual recognition, a desire to see and be seen by each other in a relationship of mutual presence where we kind of emerge from our withdrawn state, detached in our heads, and come into contact with one another uh, in a way that, that Martin Buber, the Jewish theologian, described as uh, being able to see one another as I and thou, I and thou, where I actually experience the interior of your being as I look at you and you mine, so that the encounter between us makes us fully present to each other. Uh, for those of you that have had children, at least you all were children, for sure, and see children, every newborn child manifests this presence very clearly. Newborn children are fully there in their eyes and face, seeking out eye contact with us, with the totality of their presence. And one reason they cause us to feel such an experience of joy is that they pull us out from our withinness, our withdrawnness. And suddenly, we're out there with them in a beautiful experience of what I'm calling mutual recognition. So. 
So what I would like to, I'm working to, I'm throwing myself into doing whatever I can to try to help create a world that makes that real for society, that brings into being a world that is based on our capacity to fully recognize each other, which is in all of our hearts, a longing in all of our hearts, and exists in every other that we encounter, no matter how difficult it is to see it in, say, Donald Trump or anybody that we encounter. But there is a, a problem that we all face, and that is that we are in a world in which the des this desire for mutual recognition and sight and authentic connection with each other is everywhere denied by everyone surrounding us. And without knowing it, we're denying it too in, in the process of living in a, an alienated or socially separated society. So we pass each other with blank gazes on the street. Uh, you know, we might see the outside of people's eyeballs, but we don't actually encounter each other, except at certain special historical moments. It is the case that sometimes in the rising period of social movements, street culture is transformed, and people see one another on the street as fellow humans that, who are happy to see one another and feel part of the same rising moment, as it's called. But usually we pass, pass people with, with blank gazes on the street. We exist inside a solipsistic, withdrawn universe without being conscious of it. Uh, in a way split into an outer self and, and an inner self. And this um, first fully became visible to me when I was a first year law student at Harvard in 1969. Um, it was pretty grim in 1969 around here. Um, mostly men still in suits in spite of the 60s. Um, very few women in my classes. Most of them wore dresses. Uh, just sort of giving you a snapshot of the culture of 1969. Uh, it, was, it was austere. And uh, so I would go through the, the day and then whatever, take, uh, in the mornings I would go to, the, uh, they used to be, on Everett there used to be a little cafe and I would scribble the case brief, hope I didn't get called on, all the usual things that I'm sure are still part of your life. Um, but then I would go home and at night I'd watch the news and on the news, the newscaster would come on and he would say, this particular newscaster, he would say, the Red Sox win in a fire in Dorchester, back in a moment. And then the weathermen would talk, oh, well, I thought that snowstorm was coming this morning, but it's not here yet, is it, Jim? No. It's not. And I, I'm sort of taking in that, that what I was watching was an enactment of personae, of roles, in which people were presenting themselves through these artificial means that kind of pushed me back into the couch. They were withdrawn, the, the, this newscaster was withdrawn deep inside himself as a real, supple, present human being, keeping up a puffed up, ever, ever floating, ever in danger of collapsing, outer routine. And if you've ever seen a newscaster lose his or her place, uh, they, it really is a crisis on the news because the, the work of playing a role, of playing that role is to keep keep this thing out, that you're holding outside you up rather than being something anchored to the center of, of your being, of who you actually are. So, so that, it began to occur to me, this is the world I'm in. It's not just the newscaster. It's, it's around me and I'm probably doing it too without knowing it. I'm probably blank when I pass everybody on the street. I'm trying to get by in my condition slots. Uh, private schools, making it at Harvard Law School, then maybe I'll get to somewhere. <clears throat> Through the replication of these performances, performing myself. But then I realized in particular that when I went back to law school, to my classes, they were actually replicas of the newscaster. So in my classes, <clears throat> uh, people would say, uh, first, the general style of argument, detached, analytic. Well, it seems to me that you could argue that the, there's no consideration because the piece of paper was entirely worthless. It had no value, to which someone else might say, oh no, that's true, 
but it was bargained for, and therefore, arguably, there was consideration. Now, that seems like a perfectly normal co conversation here in a way, but if you see me going from the newscaster back into class and seeing that everybody seemed to have their eyes glazed over, making arguments in each room, I began to get the uneasy feeling that I was being indoctrinated into a, not a universe of robots, but a, uh, a, a, a performative set of roles that cut me off deeply from who I am in my soul, the kind of connection I want to have with other people, the kind of, since I was dealing with social conflicts, the way I, in my heart I thought we could respond to social conflicts with an intuitive, empathic, loving intention to understand what had broken down in human relationships, and that that was not going to happen as long as we were being trained to be so cut off from, our, from the core of who we are. So, you know, the, there, for example, there's a common, there's a torts case, Yania versus Began, which establishes the principle of there's no duty to rescue in torts, where there's, a, do you know this case, a strip mining case where a guy is bantered by one person on one side of the strip mine and then f falls in or jumps in to the strip mine and he drowns. And the way we, we would deal with it in class would be very rapidly saying what I just said. Plaintiff, uh, let's see, who's the plaintiff? Probably the daughter or the wife of the person who died. Plaintiff sues defendant because of these things and these were the facts and now you go on to the principles of the case. Without any taking in of the loss, of the tragedy, of the different levels of tragedy in the situation, the, the way people were bantering each other, to, uh, daring them to dive into this very dangerous situation, not caring particularly about the guy who was drowning, um, the loss of, of uh, somebody's father who, who prob that probably harmed the life of the people in that family for decades after that tragedy. Our, our exposure to the facts in law school keeps them right at the surface of their reality and prevents us from having a moral or, or compassionate response that moves us. So we don't see how there should be a response to what took place in that case that could have healed the very substantial injury to the family, could have perhaps generated an apology from the person who did it and some greater awareness that he was participating in a sort of a pathological, daring male culture, conceivably. I'm, I'm sort of making this up, but it was, it was it was given off by the case if you responded to it that way, if you responded supplely and with depth to the human situations instead of right at the surface so that you could do a detached, analytical, rational analysis of whose rights were better, which is what we were learning in law school. We were dislearning the capacity to respond with spiritual wholeness from the core of ourselves to tragic situations and we were superimposing on top of it this clever manipulative mode of thought that cut us off from the psycho-spiritual dimension of these cases. So this set me on a long process of my own investigation into, and this was in the context of the critical legal studies movement in particular, of the legal system and how, how removed it was from being able to create a truly just society because it was reproducing results based on fostering social separation. So the, the, uh, the, the, the way that 18th century law that y you are all learning in law school passed, has been passed on to you through the generations is uh, presents the world it's, it's as if everyone were disconnected monads, each pursuing his or her own self-interest in a world in which everyone else was, was also disconnected. So in contracts, the whole subject matter of contracts presupposes a world in which, in which of socially separated actors in which what people want out of life is the benefit of their bargain with other uh, uh, other monads on the other side of the courtroom. In torts, 
you know, you don't, you can't, nobody can run into you with an automobile or you, uh, the Coca-Cola bottle can't blow up in your hands. But there is no, no notion of a duty of care, a spontaneous duty of care for others who are suffering, for homeless people who are lying on the street, for uh, just the, the, uh, the necessity of repairing harms in society that are harms to the harms to the soul, uh, uh, the longing that people have for care from one another and the opportunity to live in a world in which we do care for one another is not part of the universe of what you learn in torts. So that whole aspect of our obligation to each other as humans is left out of the case, the, of the cases, while the cases focus on just protecting us against each other as being what the, the focus of the doctrine is. So the doctrine is very difficult and complex, and you have to study it. But buried within it is this world of the world of disconnect, disconnected monads is behind it all as the way of seeing the world that is embedded in, these, in, in the law. The Constitution, a great historic document and achievement of, of a long struggle in the 18th century, has nothing in it. It's, it's about the protection of, of, an, of the isolated individual from abuses by others. But it is not about the creation of a loving community. It's not about our common effort to build a culture that fosters loving community, that fosters our capacity to fully recognize each other's humanity. That is not present in the Constitution, and it's not present in the 18th century legal culture that we now learn in each of these separated areas. Property, land, is about abstracting borders and putting them between each other and having the right to kick each other off of them. Nothing about our, the multiplicities of ways that we could share, uh, we could share the earth together. Um, Adverse possession. If you live on, on somebody's property for 50 years, in a comradely fashion, you have no right to remain there if they decide to kick you off. But if you're hostile, notorious, open, <laughs> and totally rejecting of the other person in every way possible, then you get a right to stay there. So everything is, is upside down. The, the relational dimension of the world is obscured and covered over by very complex legal doctrines that picture this, this world that I'm trying to paint for you. So we're kind of part of a we, sort of revolutionary group of lawyers shaped by the social movements of our youth, trying to create in different ways to bring into being a world that is based on different principles and to bring into being a legal culture that fosters empathy, compassion, mutual understanding, healing of the distortions that we have inherited or have, from prior generations or that have occurred in our lives that, has, that have led us to cause harm to others. Um, Martin Luther King said that justice is love correcting that which revolts against love. That idea of justice presupposes, presupposes that we, we begin bonded to each other. We are, we are love. We are the bond between each other. And our task, the task of achieving justice, is to fold into that goodness that we are, to correct aspects of ourselves and our communities that don't manifest love, but that justice correcting that which revolts against love. So lastly, I'll just say the organization that we're both part of, that is one organization that is trying to do this, is the Project for Integrating Spirituality, Law, and Politics. And uh, we have sort of four pillars of PISLAP. One is uh, a we, we foster the relationship between mindfulness and contemplative practice and social change and social justice. So there the, the idea is that if we're lost in our heads, withdrawn, and have our monkey minds swinging like crazy all the time as we talk and act in the world, we need some spiritual practices that ground us and make us present to ourselves so that we can enter into uh, forms of practice, conflict, social conflict, in a way in which we ourselves are grounded. 
for example, I'm however grounded I am today talking to you, I don't know. But if I could be, and if, I, if there are practices I could engage in that would improve that, I should do that. So that's one thing that, that PySlap does. But we also seek to transform legal education so that ideas like the ones I'm saying to you today become visible in the courses that you're taking. So that you can understand that there's a cooperative impulse in the economy that can be drawn out, emphasized, and fostered rather than the risk-taking benefit of the bargain impulse as the sole thing that you're taught about. That there's a um, that there's a, a longing to care for others in distress that we can figure out the best approaches to. So transforming legal, the, transforming the clinics so that people learn so, what I'd call psycho-spiritual skills or recognizing the client as a true human being and engaging in a relationship with clients that seek to address their whole lives and not simply their, their narrow legal problem. And not just the skills needed to handle the narrow legal problem, like how do you file a complaint, those are all really important to learn while you're in law school, but there's also a consciousness that you need to learn to transform how you'll become a lawyer. Um, and we, we are about trying to create new forms of law practice that bring into, them, bring into themselves the kind of things I'm talking about. Uh, Ross is going to work next year for the Georgia Justice Project, which is one of our Pi slap that's Project for Integrating Spirituality, Law, and Politics, Pi slap projects. At the Georgia Justice Project, lawyers make permanent contracts with their clients. If their clients are uh, uh, convicted of crimes, they go and visit them in jail. When they get out, they become part of the law firm's community. There's a kitchen in the Georgia Justice Project. They hold uh, meals twice a year for all of their current and former clients. So they, and, and they attempt to find employment and teach skills to, to clients in addition to representing them in their legal cases. So that's a whole way of conceiving of law in the community that treats a client community as a whole community and people as needing that kind of recognition of their humanity in being represented by a, a, this lawyer of the future that we're trying to create. And finally, it's just, uh, you know, we, we place great emphasis on supporting restorative justice efforts like Fania's, uh, su supporting circle processes which, are, which emphasize overcoming distortions in human relationships and healing harm rather than uh, punishing people, kicking them out of school, and doing all the things that we know are, uh, do not help bring into being a world without harm or with much less harm. Okay, thanks.